because we have become so accustomed to the certainty that human civilization is going to uh, move outward in part from the surface of planet Earth into habitats in space, we forget that these are ideas that were still new and strange uh, a few years ago. And it's worth reviewing the logic why this must be so. What will space colonies be like? First of all, there's no point in going out into space if the future that we see there is a, a sterile future of living in tin cans. Uh, we have to be able to recreate in space habitats which are as beautiful, as Earth-like, as the loveliest parts of planet Earth. And we can do that. And the reasons come down to some very simple scientific facts. First of all, what about the source of energy in space? It's the free energy of the sun, that nuclear reactor conveniently placed for us nearly 100 million miles away. The sunlight in the form that comes out in space is constant, unvarying, very powerful. And when a space colony is set up in the proper way, the sun is always in the same location relative to it, so that not just in the vicinity of the Earth, but much farther out in the solar system, it's possible to have light-gathering mirrors which can produce the same solar intensity that we have here at the distance that the Earth is from the sun. So we can provide our energy uh, at any location that we like within the solar system, even as far out as the planet Pluto and beyond. The second thing, the second requirement for the survival and the flourishing of life, of course, is the enclosure of an atmosphere. And in enclosed habitats, one can hold an atmosphere. We know that. The important thing, though, is that from an aesthetic point of view, from the point of view of human living, those habitats have got to be big. We don't want to be living in something as small as a spaceship. And within the limitations of ordinary materials like steel and glass and aluminum, it's possible to build space habitats which are as much as miles across. Habitats that would be as large as a whole county uh, here on the surface of the Earth. That's enough to provide green fields and forests grass and trees and flowers and parks, the sort of surroundings that people love to live in when they're given the opportunity. So the scale of space colonies is essential to their being attractive places for the expansion of human civilization. What about growing food? Well, we know that greenhouse agriculture, that is agriculture that is under controlled conditions, uh, grows the very best food that we have here on the surface of the earth. And the wonderful thing about it is that growing food in controlled, enclosed environments, one doesn't have to add pesticides, insecticides, and so on, because one is keeping out the pests. There's no need, really, to import mosquitoes from the surface of the earth. The other thing, of course, that we require in space habitats is gravity. Uh, here we have evolved, and so have all of the other flora and fauna of planet Earth, to Earth-normal gravity. We need to provide that same Earth-normal gravity for the proper development of our bones and for the proper development of all of the plant and animal species. Ours is the only planet where Earth-normal gravity is provided. Mars has got about half as much. Venus is uninhabitable. Mercury is even more uninhabitable in many ways, and all the others are terribly far away. But in a space habitat anywhere in the solar system or beyond, we can rotate the habitat at a slow rate to provide Earth normal gravity by the rotational gravity of centrifugal force. Newton taught us how to do that several hundred years ago, and we know exactly the speeds of rotation that are required. It doesn't even take any power. Once you set a space habitat uh, rotating, it will rotate essentially forever. Maybe a tiny electric motor to make up for the friction losses of bearings, but that's about all you require. We do need one more thing for uh, long-term flourishing of life in space, and that is protection from cosmic radiation. We can get that very simply by the slag, the waste products, 
from the processing of metals and glass that we will use for building the shells of our space habitats. What is left over? All of those tons of materials that are left over can be formed into a shield that can be set counter-rotating by just the right amount so that overall the space colony can easily point perpetually toward the sun, the source of energy. What about the shape? The best shape of a space colony as a result of many years of engineering research that's been done on the subject is spherical. If you want to hold an atmosphere within a, uh, within a pressure vessel, a sphere is the most economical kind of pressure vessel to employ. The sphere also has some other very nice properties, among them the fact that you will have Earth normal gravity at the equator, but that within just a 15 minute walk, you can walk up to the north or south, south pole of the habitat and there be in zero gravity, be able to float free and to swim in the air in the same manner that the astronauts and cosmonauts do in their tiny spacecraft of the present time. There will certainly be whole new series of uh, zero and low gravity sports that will be developed as a result of that. So everything that we need for the survival and flourishing of not just human life but all life can be found in space. The, the only hang-up that we have is that we haven't put names to those places yet. But just as we name ships, just as we name new cities, the cities of the prairies that we built back in the 19th century, we will be naming our habitats in space, and they will have names in many different languages. Because those habitats in space will represent for all of us, of all nations, the room for expansion, the room for new opportunity for the people who want to move out into new environments.